tonight. Saskatchewan teachers and the government have reached a tentative agreement on a contract, one that's endorsed by both sides. Also, Canada Post suspends mail delivery on a downtown Saskatoon block, blaming unsafe conditions. Plus, a Regina truck driver spreads positivity and joy, bringing traditional dance to his new city. This is CBC Saskatchewan News. It is Friday, May 17th, and the CBC Saskatchewan News starts right now. Good evening and thank you for watching. We begin tonight with news that the Saskatchewan Teachers Federation says they have reached a tentative agreement with the government. The two sides were back at the table this week after the teachers overwhelmingly rejected the province's last offer. There are no details on the specifics of this agreement at this point. Members will receive that information over the next few days. But STF President Samantha Beacott says they are endorsing the agreement for ratification. She did say that she observed a, quote, change of tone at the table and is feeling a little relieved. Calling it a step in the right direction, Beacott thanked teachers, parents, students, and the education minister, specifically for listening to them and for his advocacy to the government caucus to find improvements. I mean, I am a little bit relieved. This has been a challenging process for everyone involved. And uh, I mean, I'm not immune from that. I'm excited to present the details to members and have them um, have their voice within this process. Um, I am excited to see improvements to the experiences that students and teachers will have in classrooms across the province. Um, and, uh, and like I said, hopefully able to see a, a conclusion to collective bargaining and uh, and like I said, we'll go forward from there to uh, continue to see improvements hopefully in the, the years ahead. Beacott says classroom complexity and teachers' compensation were the top two priorities of bargaining. She says over the conversations this week, there were improvements in both areas. Education Minister Jeremy Cockrell says he is hopeful the new deal will be finalized. There will be a town hall for members May 21st and 22nd. The vote will take place May 29th and 30th. The province has a new Minister of Advanced Education. Colleen Young was sworn in as the new minister at Government House in Regina this morning. She's the MLA for Lloydminster. She steps into the role after the resignation of Gord Wyant. Premier Scott Moe was on hand for the ceremony and he insisted the decision was not a political calculation. So this is not a political appointment. Um, I, I'm not interested in making political appointments to Cabinet in the lead up to an election. I have confidence in, in the Cabinet that's serving and that includes uh, with Colleen Young being a part of that Cabinet as of today. Young attended the University of Saskatchewan and all eight of her children are graduates of the U of S. She also spent 20 years with the Lloydminster Public School Board. As for Gord Wyant, the MLA for Saskatoon Northwest, he had previously announced that he would not be running in the upcoming provincial election. Now this cabinet shuffle is quite minor compared to the dramatic last day of session we watched yesterday when the Speaker of the Assembly and Sask Party MLA Randy Weeks leveled a number of allegations against government members. Leader Post columnist Murray Mandrick says he's seen allegations like this before, but never from within the party. The big difference is that, like, if a member stepped out of line in the SAS party, they'd face the firing squad. Like, I mean, that's just, just the way it was. It, it, it's brutal politics, but it is, it is politics, and that's the way it but is. But not literally, right? Well, we'll get into the gun thing in a moment, but in this case, it was really bad advice to have the, the, the firing squad circle the victim because there's really a bad bit of a crossfire going on right now, and that's the problem. There was no explanation from Scott Moe yesterday that uh, of whether Jeremy Harrison really did this. All we heard is sour grapes, sour grapes. Well, Jeremy Harrison's the guy that basically talked about the Banana Republic when he lost a uh, election, a federal election in the North. So don't tell us about sour grapes. It, it happens all the time in politics. Is this true or is it not true? Because we need to know that. We need to know if this individual is as alleged uh, uh, in, unstable. I don't think he is, obviously, but, but like, I mean, that's the allegation you need to address. We need to know if he brought a gun in or even asked to bring a gun in, and that has to be asked repeatedly. Jeremy Harrison did the Jeremy Harrison thing. You know, 
and uh, when when things get tough, it's adios. He's uh, he's he's you know uh, out of there like Speedy Gonzalez. Like I mean, and this is the, the the problem is that he wasn't around to answer the question. Mo didn't answer the question well. He looked incredibly shifty, to be honest with you, going back and forth and in terms of well, you know, it, it's a Randy Weeks problem. Well, Randy Weeks was your MLA for 25 years, so it cuts both ways. You can't basically say all of a sudden he's developed a problem overnight. Randy Weeks reasonably and calmly sat down with reporters individually and says, well, certain things I can talk a little bit more about and certain things I can't. But yeah, I'll answer your questions after he made his comments. Where was Jeremy Harrison? Where was the plausible explanation from Scott Moe about what's going on? We're talking about someone accused of bringing a gun into the legislature. I think we've had a little problem with guns in, in houses in this country in the past. That's a pretty serious allegation. We're talking about a, a, the opposition leaders heard Jeremy Harrison scream, uh, open carry, open carry during a gun debate. Well, does Jeremy Harrison believe in open carry? Did he really kind of flash, you know, like, it's kind of funny because, you know, Jeremy Harrison is not uh, considered any kind of tough guy that you basically... Uh, have to worry about, but maybe you do have to uh, ask serious questions about what he's he's doing. We always knew that th in terms of the way he acted, he does have a bit of a bullying side to him, and he does have a bit of an irrational, uh, you know, pop off, I'm going to stomp out away from a scrum attitude if he doesn't like things. But I, I, you know, this is sort of something new, and this is something that Jeremy Harrison should account for, because this is now how he's being perceived in the public. And for all those reasons, this is a way bigger problem than I've seen any government have to encounter, particularly going into an election. I'm not even thinking at this particular point it's an election determinant, but I think it's a huge problem. And for Scott Moe to basically fob it off and say, oh, well, this is just some problem with the 25-year MLA that we uh, elected and up until uh, yesterday, everybody seemingly respected. You can watch more of the conversation between Murray, Stephanie, and Adam on our CBC Saskatchewan YouTube channel. Now, businesses in a block of 20th Street West in Saskatoon are no longer getting their mail delivered. Canada Post says there needs to be a delivery safety assessment in the area due to unsafe conditions earlier this week. Bertouche Dial explains. Canada Post is not delivering mail to businesses here on the 1500 block of 20th Street West in Saskatoon. The mail carrier is suspending its delivery to essentially four businesses, citing unsafe conditions. And it's not the first complaint. The FNAD Credit Union right across the street closed its branch last winter over safety concerns. Canada Post issued this letter to businesses, which says until a safety assessment is done in the area, it won't deliver. The letter does not specify what the issues are, so customers are expected to pick up their mail at a nearby depot. I'm disappointed by the short-sightedness of it. Toby Estuby is among those who received the notice. He runs the Saskatoon Community and Westside Clinics, and he says he doesn't share in Canada Post's concerns about safety, but he is concerned about what is more than an inconvenience for his clinic. Well, it's a significant impact. We, we're a medical clinic. We have 7,000 patients. We see approximately tens of thousands of appointments every year. We have communications, we have results, we have all these different things that may get communicated to us by mail. It's incredibly important to receive our mail on a daily basis. STB says other organizations in their building are affected too, but he says it's not just about the businesses. We are organizations on this block that serve a population that lives without address, that lives without home. So Canada Post has effectively cut off mail for hundreds, potentially, of people that need to get their mail on a daily basis so that they may access the services that are necessary for them to navigate complex systems of social help, social assistance within the community. STB says the neighborhood has already lost banking, income support programs, housing and shelter opportunities. I'm frustrated by the singling out of a neighborhood. He's hopeful Canada Post resumes services soon. Pratish Tayal, CBC News, Saskatoon. After weeks of protests and encampments at universities across North America, there were two pro-Palestine rallies in Saskatchewan today. 
At both universities in Regina and Saskatoon, they held what they called a liberated zone. In Regina, it's a day of solidarity with Palestine and student encampments. At the University of Saskatchewan in Saskatoon, organizers say they're not setting up an encampment. Instead, they say they're focusing on education. Basically, uh, here all day to show our solidarity with, uh, with what Palestinians are going through and, again, just educate people and... Freeing from the biases, yeah. freeing from misinformation. Um, it's a safe space. People can come, ask whatever they want, and we're just really here to show our support and give people the opportunity to learn more, to ask more questions. It can make a difference with especially people as human collectively, as students sticking together and also seeing what's happening at the other universities. I think it's more than important now ever for students as a, as a world to, to actually come together and see that change. The University of Saskatchewan says it's committed to supporting st student, staff and faculty affected by the ongoing conflict in Gaza and Israel. It says it supports freedom of expression and academic freedom, but policies, bylaws and laws also have to be followed. Well, it is the long-awaited weekend that Green Thumbs always look forward to. If you know anything about gardening in this province, you know it is risky to put anything in the ground before the May long weekend. Greenhouses are sure to be busy this weekend, even if it might be a little rainy. Ethan will have your long weekend forecast after the break. Stay with us. The weather update is brought to you by Capital Ford Lincoln. Truck time is on now. Our weather specialist, Ethan Williams, joins me now. Another day of active weather. Yeah, we've uh, seen that now shift into southeastern Saskatchewan. It looks like now uh, kind of the primary threat uh, from those storms is starting to drop off. But uh, the same system that's bringing those storms in the southeast also bringing some pretty heavy rain to uh, portions of northern Saskatchewan. Uh, this is the area that includes places like uh, uh, Candle Lake and Christopher Lake. Uh, Waska Sioux is in here in Prince Albert National Park. Uh, Meadow Lake and Buffalo Narrows uh, Boval Isle across. Uh, lots of places here where people are likely going to be taking off for the long weekend here shortly getting quite a bit of rain. How much? Well, there could be as much as 50 to 60 millimeters by the time we hit uh, the end of the day tomorrow. And uh, the rain is currently falling in that part of the province. Radar coverage cuts off here, but you can see kind of these bands that have been moving through, still moving into the north. And in uh, Alberta, yes, a little bit of snow being picked up by uh, radar there. Few remaining storms in southeastern Saskatchewan. These are non-severe uh, as they continue to march their way into Manitoba. It is mostly uh, Manitoba's problem now, the severe weather weather threat as we head into the evening. We are also seeing a few showers uh, make their way through southwestern Saskatchewan along the Trans-Canada Corridor, Maple Creek through to Swift Current, a few moderate to heavy pockets uh, there. Now this whole system that's bringing this rain is also uh, picking up the winds as well. We had a gust over 60 in Hudson Bay just a while ago and pretty much no matter where you go through the province it is just generally unsettled and that is what this system is going to do. It's going to keep doing over the next uh, well few days here. We'll see some passing showers in the south overnight tonight. These are pop-up showers and thunderstorms, so not a guarantee that we're going to see this. This whole complex of rain showers begins to slightly move north overnight tonight. For tomorrow, we may actually see a little bit of clearing in southern Saskatchewan as we get into the later afternoon hours as central and northern regions continue to be cloudy. That uh, sun may last or spread a little bit northward even into Sunday as this rain, yes, may change over to snow early Sunday morning. This model, I think, is a bit aggressive on the snow front, though. I don't think we're going to see a lot of snow. I think it's going to be probably mixed with rain, and I don't think it's going to drop as far south as we're seeing here, but definitely some moisture possible in little pockets through pretty much all the long weekend for all the province. It's sporadic for south and central, so uh, you know some of these amounts are dependent on if we actually do get any showers or thunderstorms, but generally probably 5 to 10 millimeters over these next 72 hours here in the south half of the province. For the north, yeah, some heavier amounts here could be pockets of another 30 to 50 millimeters, especially through the Churchill region, and this runs until 
until Monday around the supper hour. Going to be quite windy in southern Saskatchewan tomorrow with gusts near 70 and still a little bit breezy for uh, those of us on Sunday. So the whole weekend shaping up like this. Possible morning showers in Regina before clearing in the afternoon. But as I say, quite gusty. Some sun for Sunday. Possible showers Monday, Tuesday and a return to some more stable weather, albeit a little bit cooler for the middle of next week. Saskatoon, I think you have a chance of showers and thunderstorms for much of tomorrow. Temperatures drop on the holiday Monday, so it'll be cool for your Monday before things sort of rebound for next week, but still a little bit unsettled from here and there, Sam. So that prolonged warmth, still waiting for it. But it looks like Sunday is your day to play in the mud or dirt, depending where you are. Exactly. I mean, might need some rain boots, yes. All right. Thanks, Ethan. You bet. Okay, how cute are these little guys? Two snow leopard cubs born Monday at the Toronto Zoo. You can see the cubs cuddling with their mom, Jita. Pemba, the cubs' dad, and Jita came to Toronto as part of the Snow Leopard Species Survival Plan. It's a cooperative breeding program among zoos in North America. We'll be back after the break. Alberta RCMP say they have linked the murders of four young victims in Calgary in the 1970s to a serial killer. They say Gary Allen Sreri died in Idaho prison in 2011. With assistance from Interpol and the Idaho State Police Forensic Services, Sreri's DNA was confirmed as a match to the unknown male DNA profile present on all four of our young victims. Due to the forensic evidence, witness statements, and similar fact evidence, the Alberta RCMP believe that Gary Allen Sereri is responsible for the murders of Patsy McQueen, Eva Dvorak, Melissa Rohorak, and Barbara McLean. The RCMP also say the killer may have had more victims. They say Sereri lived between Canada and the United States, often changing his appearance and using aliases to hide his identity. A CBC News investigation shows that most Canadian universities do not track student suicide. Deanna Sumanak Johnson has more on our exclusive findings and why some say they're so concerning. When he was in his first year of university studying science and playing football, Isaiah Neal says he was under a lot of pressure. Then he had a concussion. Everything kind of just went boom after that. I became depressed. And after about a month of being depressed, I had suicidal ideation and had to go see a therapist. Recent reports show that mental health of university-aged people has declined since the pandemic. But we have learned just how difficult it is to get a precise look at how many students struggle with thoughts of suicide. CBC News reached out to 52 major universities in Canada. The exclusive investigation found that more than 70% did not internally track student suicides or attempted suicides. Understanding and tracking suicide allows us to react and try to provide supports and services to the student communities if we're not serving them adequately. Some university officials say there are good reasons this information isn't collected. We are sensitive to the privacy issues. We're very sensitive to the mourning and the loss that the family and friends of the deceased go through. And so we don't um, track it because there is actually no reporting structure from the chief medical examiner back to us in terms of cause of death. But some family members who have lost loved ones say knowledge is power. Andrea Howell's son's university did track suicides at the time of his death on campus in 2017, but these numbers weren't publicly shared. I know there was another student that had died by suicide the month prior to Chase in his dorm, and that brought up questions for me whether um, an opportunity might have been missed for me to have a conversation with Chase after that event. As she advocates for more transparency, hey, sweetie. Isaiah Neal is working with suicide prevention organization Jack.org to help peers who may also be struggling and feel they have nowhere to turn in moments of crisis. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. Anyone struggling with thoughts of suicide can call or text the suicide crisis line. That's 988, 24 hours a day.
One last look at the long weekend weather, Ethan. Yeah, and uh, what you see here is going to sum up a lot of what we're going to see. Some showers tonight in Regina possible. Otherwise, mostly cloudy skies. Maybe some uh, patches of fog here and there as well. We get into tomorrow morning already quite windy. Those west winds near 50. Cloudy skies at 8 o'clock and uh, still cloudy by the noon hour with some possible uh, showers here and there. I think we will, though, get a bit of clearing as we head into the afternoon. For Saskatoon, cloudy tonight. Winds staying breezy through the night likely a uh, chance of showers as we head into the morning and likely into the afternoon uh, as well for the first part anyway temperature is not going to get too warm uh, maybe some clearing as well so some sun on the way for later uh, to tomorrow and possibly Sunday as well Sam all right thanks Ethan you are you're welcome and uh, before we leave you this week, you cannot miss the energy at the Bongra Cruise Regina studio. And recently, they created a special dance for CBC Saskatchewan in celebration of Asian Heritage Month. There wasn't uh, really any professional dance academy in Regina, and I was really interested in being a part of something that I felt proud of. And uh, when I didn't see an opportunity, I decided to make one. My name is Karandeep Singh, and I'm the director and choreographer of Bangra Kru Regina. I was born in India, but I was raised in Dubai, and I recently moved to Canada. So Bangra is a North Indian folk dance, traditional folk dance. It's, it's mainly done by the men in the previous uh, ages, and but with the modern world, everyone, even the ladies and men, and now the kids are really learning about it. I've been learning Pangra since I was a kid, either from someone, uh, someone who could help me or from the YouTube or you know any, any other platform I, uh, that was available. And I've been uh, on the stages since I was a kid. So I started Bangra Crew in June 2022. And then ever since we have been uh, dancing, growing the team, we have kids. Uh, learning from us from the age of five years and above and uh, we have a team of 50 plus right now. It showcases our rich culture, how it was in the olden days and how we should never forget our roots and we should continue to stick to basics and uh, try to bring a positive image of wherever we are from or wherever we are staying. Being able to do Bangra is something that's really challenging and as well as it's very motivating for some people. Their lives have been, uh, I would say not for the kids, but for the adults who are learning from me, it's been a very positive for them. When you do Bangra, you gain a different kind of confidence which you're able to use in your everyday life. So I wish to take Regina on a world map of Bangra. Uh, hopefully I can make uh, competing teams in Regina and then I'll be able to show people that we got talent in Regina. That's some long weekend energy and that is it for us this week. For news anytime, head to cbc.ca slash sask, head to our YouTube channel or download the CBC News app. Thanks for watching. Have a great weekend.